It was by faith and providence that the Nigerian Army Colonel of Yoruba origin turned into an accidental Biafran Major General, fighting on the side of the secessionist army. In 1967, this accidental Biafran Major General Victor Banjo was arrested, tried and executed along with three others for subversion. In this video, we re-examine the story of the trial and execution of Victor Banjo and three others. We will answer the questions, was Biafran government fair to Banjo? Was Ojuku paranoid and overacted? Or was it Banjo's fault? Please stay with me. Welcome to His Pool Media In-Depth History. Except for areas under enemy control, the whole of Biafra is committed to independence without distinction. At least, this was the view of the Chief Justice of the Biafran Court of Appeal, Sir Louis Mbanefu, in June 1968. But was this the case in the new country? The reality, however, is that there were many people within Biafra who did not regard themselves as Biafrans. In fact, the Biafran government feared that the situation within the new country might be divided from within. Hence, in the early months of the war, Biafra's leadership became increasingly paranoid about the threat of subversion and espionage. Chuku Emeka Odumegu Ojuku found internal enemies everywhere he turned, and no one was above suspicion. Now, before we continue, if you receive any value from our informative contents, please like this video and consider subscribing to His Pool Media. Don't forget to leave a comment below. Thank you. The case, the state versus Victor Banjo and three others provide a view of how politics was played within Biafra and gives insight into how paranoia became enshrined in Biafra's political culture in the first months of the war. Far from being an isolated case of treason, it was a referendum on Biafra's nationality, the ethnic composition of the new country, and the relationship between the war and the larger tax of creating a Biafran state. In a way, the case helps to create a feeling that non Easterners were not wholly regarded as Biafrans and breed suspicion about the internal politics of Biafra. It also created an excuse for increasingly absolute power in the daily administration within the new country. At least, Biafra considered itself a nation of orderliness and equality, but the emergency measures implemented early in the war were used not only to maintain order in a general sense, but to blunt political dissents and to root out saboteurs both real and imagined. As the political and humanitarian situation worsened during the course of the conflict, the Biafran state used a dwindling coercive powers to eliminate so-called spies, saboteurs, and traitors to the Biafran cause. Remember, Biafra's secession was predicated on the claim that Nigeria had become lawless, particularly the inability of the Nigerian government to stop the killing of Igbos in the north in 1966 was the clearest proof of that claim. So, the Biafran leadership made the case for secession as a restoration of law and order. Since the Biafran authorities lay claim to the maintenance of law and order as opposed to the Nigerian states, the court system was still working even after other sectors of the economy had shut down as a result of the conflict. The growing paranoia within the Biafran leadership, the humiliation of Banjo's retreat from the West, and the burden that the war placed on Biafra's judiciary came to a climax in 1967 when Biafran Army Major General Victor Banjo was tried and executed for subversion. Banjo was a Yoruba military officer from southwestern Nigeria who was imprisoned in January 1966 for his role in the failed coup that brought Nigeria's First Republic to an end. When Biafra seceded, he was serving his sentence in the eastern region and seeing Banjo as a figure who could help to make the case for Biafra's independence to the Yorubas in the federal Nigeria, Hojuku offered him the chance to leave prison and join the Biafran army. His task was to lead a supposed liberation army to occupy the Midwest and then march on to capture Lagos. As Banjo marched towards the west, a British intelligence source would note, his lines would then touch sympathetic courts in many Yoruba circles in the western region. But what Banjo sought to achieve by accepting Ojuku's offer is a point of debate. Unfortunately, however, he himself was not clear 
about his intentions. Soon after Biafra's breakup, he wrote a letter to his wife where he stated, quote, I never approved of the idea of my friend here, Ojuku, declaring a separate state, but one cannot always control the behavior of one's friends. Everyone has a right to an opinion on any matter, and in both political and military crises, the ultimate test of sagacity is in the sources of failure thereof. Banjo's release and commissioned into the Biafran army generated considerable dispute among the army's leadership, and when suspicion fell on Banjo, he found few allies among his Biafran colleagues. In his orders to Banjo, Ojuku stated that the Biafran troops under his command will remain in the southwest just as long as we in Biafra think it essential for the Yorubas to consolidate their position and sovereignty against any foreign trade. Banjo accepted the offer and was given command of Biafra's first and only major offensive campaign which intended to take the Midwest states. Banjo's mission in July 1967 was initially successful with 7,000 Biafran troops seizing Benin's capital city in just a few days, sending the Midwest state's military governor fleeing on the back of a bicycle. Despite these sources, many in the Biafran government began to doubt Banjo's loyalty at this point. Chinua Achebe, for example, later recalled that his speech announcing the occupation sounded to me far more like a lament of Nigeria's breakup than a speech coming from a Biafran military leader or an explanation for the invasion of Nigeria's territory or Biafran secession. The brief takeover of the Midwest states, which was proclaimed the Republic of Benin, in an attempt to appeal to the local people in September 1967, was divided and unstable. Although some Igbo-speaking Midwesterners supported the Biafran troops, the majority of the people stayed loyal to the federal side and some engaged in deception against the occupying Biafran army. According to one Nigerian administrator, Biafra ruthlessly dominated the occupied territory. He was quoted as saying, They were fears of abduction, torture, detention, and even murder of opponents. End of quote. Anxiety had gripped the inhabitants of the Midwest as it was impossible to know who was an agent for the secessionist government. Victor Banjo was given orders to march on to Lagos, but the Biafran troops faced opposition at Ore and retreated, losing control of the Midwest in the process. Biafra's humiliating retreat was an embarrassment to Ojuku, a huge blow to Biafran morale, and according to many analysts, the first step towards Biafra's eventual military disadvantage. Upon their return to Inugu, Colonel Victor Banjo and Major Emmanuel Ifeajuna, a Nigerian turned Biafran officer who had participated in the coup that overthrew the First Republic, as well as their subordinate Major Philip Alele and Samuel Agbam, were arrested and tried before the Special Tribunal of Biafra for two counts of violating the Law and Order Maintenance Decree of 1967. The first charge was that the officers without lawful authority made preparation of carrying out an armed disturbance against the military governor and some officers of the Republic of Biafra, which was essentially a charge of insubordination for turning back at Ure and failing to capture Lagos following their occupation of the Midwest. The second charge, framed as subversion, was that they, with intention to cause breach of public order, agreed to procure the downfall of the government of the said Republic by violent and unlawful seizure of the military governor and head of state of the Republic of Biafra, and commander-in-chief of its armed forces and other military officers. The state prosecutors had alleged that the officers had devised a plan against Ojuku that would conclude in their capturing power in either Biafra, Nigeria, or both, which would be followed by turning over control to Obafemi Awolewo, according to most versions of the story. Although multiple sources supported the existence of a plot, the details of the charges against Banjo and the others appear to be fabricated. In addition to subversion, the charges included foreign currency stockpiling, coordinating with foreign agents and other minor offenses. Philip Alele was charged with a third offense, intent to incite a breach of public order, 
for communicating with trade unionists. Why Banjo stopped at Ore instead of continuing on to seize Lagos, which despite Ojuku's confident statement to the contrary, would have been an extremely difficult order to carry out, was a source of considerable debate. The trial did little to resolve this matter. One account of the situation, supported by Banjo's sister, is that Banjo switched sides during the war concluding that he did not want Ojuku to have control of all of the southern Nigeria. According to this perspective, Banjo saved the southwest from control and occupation while well aware that he was endangering his own life. Consequent upon this, the western region was saved from a second occupation by Igbo soldiers after the first spell with the Hausa soldiers. Other interpretations contend that Banjo's motives were always traitorous and that his objective was always to transfer power in the Midwest to Awolowo. According to Bernard Odogu, Biafra's director of military intelligence, Banjo's life objective was power and rulership of Nigeria. British and American intelligence reports suggest that there was credence to the idea that Banjo had political ambitions. At a meeting with a British deputy commissioner in Benin, on the 9th of August 1967, Banjo is reported to have said that he does not agree with Ojuku on the separate existence of Biafra. He is convinced that the United Nigeria is essential, and Banjo approached British and American operatives about whether he could count on their support if he defected to the Nigerian side. The trial was disorganized and hasty. Banjo's hearing was held on a single day on September 28, 1967, presided over by Justice George Ekemena, who was assisted by a military officer and a civilian administrator. Evidence for the prosecution was presented by the head of Biafra's army and intelligence directorate, along with different witnesses whom the conspirators allegedly tried to enlist into their conspiracy or who overheard the negotiations taking place. Banjo and Ife Ajuna, exhausted and poorly fed, conducted a cursory and inadequate cross-examination of the prosecution's witnesses. Banjo, speaking on behalf of all four men and without legal representation, mounted only a brief defense of their actions. Perhaps, realizing that the decision had already been made, the statement of accused consisted of the accused person's activities in assisting the governor one way or the other to successfully prosecute the war. He stated that there was a group of young men who met occasionally to discuss current state of affairs and the conflict. He said also that this group never plotted to overthrow the government. He claimed that the accused could not have been involved in such a scheme given their previous performances and their strong regard for the governor. This appeal in favor of Ojuku was not successful, but because the tribunal was stuck against the accused, there was likely no defense that could have prevailed. A civilian lawyer that was sent to the tribunal later stated that he had been directed to convict the four individuals regardless of their defense or how poor the case against them was. When the lawyer refused to do so, he was detained and spent the remainder of the war period in prison. Justice Nkemena, otherwise known as a defender of judicial independence, agreed to chair the tribunal. Nelson Ota recalled that the trial was a solemn and scrupulous affair, despite the hysteria and white hot hate that were riding the wind. Outside the heavily guarded courtroom were thousands of men and women who, however mistaken they were, strongly believed that the four men on trial had sold Biafra and therefore deserved nothing but death. Have them all shot was the popular cry of these men outside the courtroom. The trial proceedings appeared impartial. However, in Arthur's view, it was a trial that in normal circumstances he would have thrown out of hand. Victor Banjo, Emmanuel Fiaduna and their subordinates were sentenced to death by firing squad. They were executed four days later in a yard near Biafran Army Headquarters. The execution was conducted under the perfect glare of mass publicity. 
Everybody who could stand the sight was permitted to go along and witness how Biafra supposedly deals with saboteurs. The court proceedings, which has been officially held in secret, allowed the Biafran government to maintain the appearance of judicialism, control the narratives, and prevent any possibility of public sympathy for the plotters. The state versus Victor Banjo and three others was a stage-managed political performance intended to demonstrate to Biafran population that everyone was being closely watched. The case was also a message to the judiciary and to government employees in general that you were not allowed to go against Ojuku's wishes. It also demonstrated to the soldiers the consequences of disloyalty. In the eyes of the Biafran propagandists, three types of saboteurs were identified. One was the hired agent of Nigeria. The second was the expatriate whose sympathy lay with Nigeria. And the third was the indigents whose actions and inactions create difficulty for the Biafran society. Banjo and Ifia Juna did not fit any of these categories perfectly. Consequently, some Biafrans found the execution of Victor Banjo and three others as disturbing and interpreted it as a signal of future repressive actions to come. Many observers were angry with Banjo and Ifeajuna for their betrayal, but were also disturbed by their executions and for the note of paranoia that it brought into Biafra's political life. Their guilt or innocence cannot be easily discerned from Biafra's partial historical records, but the consequences of their executions are clear. In the aftermath of the Banjo trial, a simple suggestion that Biafra should make peace with Nigeria could be considered sabotage. Imaginary spies and saboteurs were seen almost everywhere, and the state began to consume itself from within. This trial was also important because it revealed the fault lines within Biafra and her national identity. The question of who to be considered a Biafran became highly contestable and now preclude the Yorubas like Banjo. And finally, Banjo's trial did little to assuage fears that known Igbos including Ibibios, Efik, Ijo and others would be marginalized in a new country. This fear is still being expressed today when Biafra is mentioned in any discussion among the minority elements. If you find any value from this video, please like it and consider subscribing to Hispul Media. Don't forget to leave a comment below. Click on the video displayed here to watch our previous episode on Victor Banjo. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.